cream teas, bunting, the local shop, thatched cottages swathed in roses, and quaint church spires. Go! Oh! It's not hard to conjure the perfect village from the imagination, but for me, villages are so much more. As an actress, I've played many roles, but in real life, I'm a villager. I've lived in a village for over 36 years, and I know a thing or two about the challenges the communities face. So in this series, I'll show what makes villages unique and learn about their past, present, and their future. Villages may look like places of peace and tranquility, but beneath that sleepy appearance lies an intriguing and hidden world. On my journey, I'll explore classic, picturesque villages that are so familiar to us all. Magnificent, isn't it? But I will also reveal communities that will surprise and challenge what it means to be a village. I don't think anyone really knows what they're doing. And I'll discover just what it is that makes us feel so passionately about this quintessentially British institution. Breathtaking, isn't it? Some of Britain's most beautiful landscapes and picturesque villages have provided the inspiration for writers, artists, and filmmakers. And the notion of this ideal village has been imprinted on our imagination. But hidden beneath the surface of this seemingly flawless world, village life and lives have had to adapt to changing times. A new generation of villagers are playing their part in keeping our rural traditions alive by sustaining the community ways that have endured for centuries. There are over 10,000 villages in Britain and our rich village heritage was captured in a series of books that are fascinating reading. In the 1930s, a small publishing house called Batsford published a wide range of books on everything from gardens to churches to villages. While the authors varied, the covers were illustrated by one man, Sir Brian Cook Batsford, who captured epic landscapes and iconic images of village life, workers' villages of the industrial north, thatched cottages in the hills and coastal communities living off the sea. I'm following the Batsford Guide to three counties in the southwest, Dorset, Somerset, and Wiltshire, all part of the ancient Anglo-Saxon area of Wessex, and a place where rural life was portrayed so vividly in literature. This is hardy country. He wrote so beautifully about it because he understood the landscape and its villages. He said, every village has its idiosyncrasy, its constitution. Thomas Hardy, the son of a stonemason, was born in Dorset in 1840. And this area of southwest England was the inspiration for his romanticized county of Wessex. It was the setting for many of his down-to-earth and sometimes brooding poems and novels. The great thing about Hardy's writing is that he didn't see just the rural idyll that we like to imagine. He wrote about the violence, the loves, the deaths that happen in all communities. Now, as you may recall, once upon a time, I was part of a fictitious rural community. Not quite Hardy-esque, though. 
I suppose the one that most people recognise is to the Manor Vaughan. And the, the, the house where we filmed it in Somerset. But we used to go a lot around the region. But I got to know and made me rather love this area. And I always look back on it with such fun. I'm in the picturesque village of Montacute. I remember filming an episode here. Oof, must be three decades ago. And it's hardly changed at all. It's still lovely. However, when the author of my guidebook came here, he was rather less than complimentary. It is a fine village, as one might say, a fine woman. With a touch of brazenness in the way it displays itself, and with little of the seductive charm of some villages. I think it's totally charming. It's hardly surprising that this area, which is littered with beautiful traditional villages, has played such a prominent role in so many film and television productions. I'm heading over the border to Wiltshire and the village of Laycock. It's one of the jewels in the crown of the National Trust. They actually own most of it. And it's a stunning example of medieval architecture at its best. The glorious thing about villages like this is that it's all different periods. You see all the roof heights. I love that. They just got built cheek by jowl. Over here, this building I see is 1824. These are much, much earlier. Couldn't happen today because everyone wants things uniform. For the thousands of people who flock here every year, this is quintessential village England. I suppose we all have an idea of what the perfect village should look like. And those ideas come in various ways, through literature or paintings. But there's one invention that meant the image of a village could be seen by everybody, the photograph. Now, this rather unimpressive photograph was the start of a phenomenon, and it has a rather interesting history. This wonderful building is Laycock Abbey, and it was home to William Henry Fox Talbot. 180 years ago, in 1834, Talbot gave us the ability to see and record the world in a completely different way. He invented the negative-positive photographic process. I'm meeting Roger Watson, who's taking me to a very special spot inside the Abbey. It's this window right here. Oh. It's a nice view, and it's a beautiful uh, latticed window. But this is the site of the first photographic negative that William Henry Fox Talbot made. So was he photographing the view? No, it was the window itself where he could get strong, dark lines against a very bright sky. This is an example of the uh, camera that he would have used for making his first photograph. And there's not much to it, really. It's just a, a rough wooden box. And the lens in it is the eyepiece out of uh, one of his microscopes. So where was the negative? The negative was actually on the, on the back door of the camera here. Right. And we've got a little copy of it here. If you're looking for excitement in photography, a picture of a window probably is in it. What inspired Fox Talbot? He was a lousy artist. He had gone on honeymoon in Italy and uh, his wife was drawing and he was trying his best and his drawings were awful. <laughs> he called them melancholy to behold, and they were. And so he began to think in his scientific mind, how do we go about making a machine that can draw for me? Talbot went on to record scenes around Laycock. They're a remarkable record of rural life over a century and a half ago. They include this image of Laycock taken in 1842 believed to be the very first photograph of the village. I'm going to try and recreate this photo 
with a camera, which I happen to have here. Yes, it is. There it is. Now, if I press that, it'll come up. And you see, it is virtually the same. The pub sign was on a pole. And, of course, the thing that is most different are the cars. Although it was a lot dirtier then, because there was no tarmac, and you see the dirt went right up the wall. It's rather good, isn't it? I'm not a photographer, but not too bad. I'm continuing my journey in Wiltshire. There are so many lovely villages in England, and I'm lucky enough to have seen a few of them. But I'm now heading for one that is considered to be the most picturesque in the land. Castle Coombe in Wiltshire that has never known the hurry of modern life. And here is the prettiest village in England. Who says so? Why, the British Travel Association, who decided on Castle Coombe after examining all claimants to the title. Castle Coombe was voted Britain's prettiest village in the early 1960s when the boom in tourism fueled a huge appetite for trips to Britain's picturesque villages. The author of my guidebook was here a decade earlier, in 1950, waxing lyrical about Castle Coombe's exquisite looks. At first sight, it seems almost too good to be true, with its golden stone and ochre or salmon-colored houses lining the twisting lanes. There is a picturesque village shop or two, a comfortable looking inn and a market cross, all protected by roofs of stout grey stone slates, above which rises the tall 15th century tower of the church, backed by steep hangers of beech woods. It seems indeed like the ideal English village produced for a film set rather than the genuine article you see, Batsford realized all those years ago that it would be used for a film, and indeed it has. Just as art, literature, and photography have cemented the way we think about the perfect traditional village, films have played a huge part too. Castle Coombe was used by Steven Spielberg as an idealized village in War Horse, set in the years around the First World War. One of the reasons for the casting? It looked so perfect, he didn't have to change much. And in 1966, Castle Coombe was used as a village in the fantasy film Doctor Doolittle, but with a Hollywood twist. 20th Century Fox transformed part of this famous beauty spot into a fishing village. A lot of people were disturbed about the choice of one of England's prettiest villages as a film set. Indeed, four men even try to blow up the dam used to create an artificial lake. But as the unit departs, the doubts and fears prove to have been groundless. There's a part of Castle Coombe that you certainly don't associate with a rural idyll, and that's a motor racing circuit. The racetrack opened in 1950, thanks to an extraordinary woman, Kay Thomas, a local landowner and motor racing enthusiast who created the circuit with a local car club. In its 1950s heyday, the top names in motorsport like Sterling Moss thrilled huge crowds at Castle Coombe. I'm not going to be a racing driver. I don't like the hats. Well, I'm apparently about to go around the most challenging circuit in the UK, I think, not the world. So, fingers crossed. Gosh. Way! According to saloon car champion Russell Pointer Brown, 
What makes it so testing are the bends. This is uh, known as Quarry Corner. This is the most technically challenging corner in British motorsport. And is this the um, tightest corner? It's one of the most technically difficult corners because you have a change of elevation, change of direction, all in a relatively short space of time. These days, Russell spends his time teaching novices how to take these corners. So when you're teaching people, how many come adrift? Um, when I'm teaching them, none so far, Penelope. I think I'm becoming a bit of a speed freak. It was a delight to take you around. That's really kind of you. I enjoyed that, but now I'm going to the hairdressers. Next, the changes in a village that require royal approval. If we want to change the colour of our front door, we're supposed to ask the duchy for permission. And is it granted? And the community, who are all pulling together. Gosh! Right there. It's more difficult to stop than start, well, is it? it is. <laughs> <laughs> journey through the villages of southwest England. Many of our villages have been created by centuries of slow, almost imperceptible change. But as their populations and prosperity ebbs and flows, their character alters. I'm heading to a place whose iconic good looks aren't all they seem. I have just trekked up what felt like climbing Snowdon so I could see this wonderful view. Breathtaking, isn't it? And I could compare it with the front of this Batsford book, the glorious painting by Brian Cook. See, virtually the same. The church, the trees, wonderful use of color. Th those trees there have grown up a bit, but that's what trees do. However, there's a slight problem because the front of the book is entitled English Village Homes. But Mere isn't a village, it's a town. But when you walk around Mere, it actually feels and looks like a village. It has small rows of cottages made from local stone and a church dominating the skyline. What a fascinating conundrum. I want to get to the bottom of it. Historian and archaeologist Alex Langmans lives in Wiltshire and knows a thing or two about Britain's village heritage. I'm doing a programme on villages. Right. This isn't a village, is it? Mm. Probably not really. I mean, it depends who you talk to around here on whether it's a village, big village, small town. But actually, some of the clues that you can see just stood here are telling us that really this is probably a town and always has been. I mean, for the first uh, instance, we've got this clock tower here. Now, this actually replaced, in 1868, what was called a market house. OK, Market House would have been a two-storey building, arches underneath, the top of it would have had the Guild Hall. Yeah. And you look at the width of this street as well, and that's telling me as a, an archaeologist that when you've got this kind of width, you, this isn't just a road coming through, certainly further back. You've got a market square here, there's no doubt about it. When did people decide it was a village? It can't just be people coming in well, saying, I want to live in a village, because it palpably isn't. Well, I think what's happened is the changing fortunes of places like this. I mean, in the 14th century, this was a very rich part of the world. Of You've got the main London to Exeter Road. Things were booming. It was a town. But, of course, by the time you get to the 18th century, improvements to the road network and the turnpiking meant that actually places like Shaftesbury, Froome, Bruton, Sherbourne, these were all on the rise and it's probably the case that Mia started to shrink somewhat. So that's settled then. Mia is a town. 
And what we think of as a traditional village is surprisingly modern. If you go right back into the medieval period, you'd be desperate to get some kind of town charter or market charter because that could massively improve the fortunes of the settlement, bring wealth to the settlement. But of course, when we get to the 20th century, and this starts actually in the late 19th century, but certainly in the 20th century, we start to, as a society, build up this romantic image of what a village is. It's this quiet retreat, this cottage in the country that we can go to, this kind of rural idyll, if you like. Our perception of villages as rural idylls is very much bound up with the way they look. And there is perhaps one feature that has become a standard bearer for the image of a classic, traditional village the thatched roof. I'm on my way to Chiddock in Dorset, which is a hotbed of thatching. Thatch, of course, is found throughout Britain, but Dorset is home to an amazing 12% of the UK's thatch. And Chiddock has 72 properties with thatched roofs all of which have been thatched by one man, Dave Simmons. This is your own house? Yes, it is. So how often do you have to re-thatch? Well, this was done by me the last time, 31 years ago. Well, so. that's good, isn't it? So how long have you been thatching? Uh, 48 years. Really? Yeah. So you started as a wee one? Yeah, yeah, I started at 15, straight out of school, 15. So with all the thatch cottages, does that mean you're kept permanently employed? Oh, very much so. They all need attention every 10 years. Really? And, and a re-thatch possibly every 20, 25 years. Dave is carrying on a craft that can be traced as far back as the Bronze Age. And the tools that are used today haven't changed in hundreds of years. Like the bat used to give the reeds an even finish, called a legate. Dave's legate is the same one he had when he started as an apprentice 48 years ago. There are subtle regional variations in thatching styles, and the Dorset style is said to resemble poured custard. Ooh, how delicious. Conservation regulations dictate that Dorset thatch has to be made from traditional wheat straw. But modern farming methods mean that this is increasingly hard to come by. So, Dave's come up with an ingenious solution. He grows his own. Dave's wheat is a traditional variety with longer stalks. The wheat is threshed to remove the ears before being tied into bundles ready for thatching. Now, you're part of this village community. Yeah. You've lived here all your life. Are there many people who've lived here for long? Yeah, there's quite a handful. I mean, we... we... There's your church? <laughs> That's is my it? Town. That's your firm. My firm. <laughs> <laughs> Would you believe? Well, no, I I've got a it. recording of our church bells on the firm. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Dave is not only the village thatcher, he's a campanologist. That's a bell ringer to you and me. If thatch roofs are part of our collective notion of what makes an ideal village, then church bells are also a feature that no real village should be without. Chiddock's bells have been a vital part of the community for over 400 years, but they nearly fell silent forever in 2011, when the bell frame became unstable. But they were so loved by the villagers that the community raised an amazing 70,000 pounds in just nine months to save them. And now they're enjoyed by everyone, old and young. Brilliant. <laughs> Almost brilliant. It's more difficult to stop than start, oh, is it? it is. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't it heavy? Yeah. It is, is it? You've got to have really strong arms, don't you? Yes. 
At 12 years old, Dushka is one of the youngest ringers in Chidduk. Bell ringing in churches can be traced back to the 8th century, but it was only in the 17th century that we got tuned bells, rung in patterns called changes, which is where we get the phrase, ringing the changes. Do you all think it's important for the village to have bells? I think a lot of people expect the bells, they're here, and they expect them to be rung on certain occasions, and it is important to the village. Well, I, I love the sound of, ch uh, of bells, so can we have one more ring? Mm. Yes, sir. You ready, Nick? Look to Trouble's going. She's gone. It's wonderful that the community here in Chidduck has rallied around to save their bells and that they are still such an integral part of village life. Long may they chime. I'm heading to a place where architects and planners have attempted to replicate the essence of a traditional village. This is the village of Poundbury, which on the surface looks as though it's full of different architecture, which it is. There's brick, there's rendering, there's a sort of cottages down there, lots of brick around, and a rather imposing Georgian house, except if you look, it was built in 1996, which is some 20 years ago. It's the vision of His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Poundbury was built on land owned by the Duchy of Cornwall and followed the principles of urban and rural planning set out in Prince Charles's book, Vision of Britain. The concept behind Poundbury was to take the blueprint of a successful village and apply it to a modern setting. So, architects have created an integrated community of shops and businesses with private and social housing. Many of the houses follow an old-fashioned organic street pattern in a bid to foster neighborliness. There are around 2,500 people living in Poundbury, and to ensure it stays the way the designers intended, there are certain rules that have to be followed all laid down in print. It's called Living in Poundbury. Introduction. The PRA, I assume that's the Poundbury Residents Association, hate acronyms, have agreed to publish this pamphlet to address the many queries, myths and assumptions which have arisen about living in Poundbury. We hope this will be helpful to you and provide some answers to common problems. In essence, the success of the community in Poundbury depends on courtesy to others, good neighborliness, and talking to your neighbors, and compliance with the covenants and stipulations, of which there are quite a lot. My bedtime reading for tonight. The book states that residents require consent from the duchy to paint or decorate the exterior of their houses. They're not allowed to park any caravans or boats on their property. And the book also says that the loose gravel around public areas is causing a problem with cat mess. And residents are encouraged to offer alternatives. The Residents Association committee member who wrote the book is Fran Lipa. If you don't have a kind of a code by which you live in this sort of community, then you will have problems. Because it's a new village, you have to set down your code, is that it? I yeah. mean, because uh, normally in villages it goes from father to son to grandmother to granddaughter. 
Yes, and also uh, the duchy set it. And also, as you know, in some very gorgeous villages, you have codes about what colour you can paint your front door. Well, each group of houses has a palette of colours, and if we want to change the colour of our front door, we're supposed to ask the duchy for permission. And is it granted? Yes. Now, what are the other things? I mean, what is the offence punishable by the stocks in the square that you can't having bear? A, having a television aerial. Really? Your own television aerial is not allowed. We all are part of a, t um, a zonal aerial system so you'll find some communal areas trying to hide behind cupboards <laughs> in courtyards and we are cabled underneath from those aerials into our houses so we must not have our own aerials so you won't see them round here at all right poundbury is actually growing on the outskirts of the original village there are new developments underway Maybe Poundbury, with its singular vision, will become a victim of its own success. Poundbury's grand new design is a bold idea and should be applauded. But in village terms, it's very young. Only time will tell if it's a success. I think I'll come back in about ooh, 25 years and see how it's worked out. Next, I explore traditional livelihoods that are under threat. He's going back in now. Goodbye. And meet the villagers who are battling the floods. I mean, Peter and I decided we'd only talk about flooding on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't do that. There's always something going on. I'm continuing my journey around the villages of the southwest. What always amazes me when I'm driving through this country is how every county seems to have its own particular feel and look. And I wonder if Mr. Cook felt that so strongly. From the 1930s to the 50s, Sir Brian Cook was the illustrator of my guides, and he really captured the tranquil beauty of this area. The colors he uses in his paintings, not detailed, splodges sometimes, I think, but amazing. You see, we've got the lovely golden fields, and then in the distance, it does look blue. However, Today, our villages are having to face up to change. Traditional livelihoods are being re-evaluated, and villagers are even having to rethink their relationship with the weather. I'm heading to Dorset and the sea. I love being on a beach, and this one is absolutely beautiful. Behind me, you see the wonderful Jurassic coast. Glorious. The 95-mile Jurassic Coast stretches from East Devon to here in Dorset, and it's so geologically important that it's a World Heritage Site. I'm in West Bay, near Bridport. Often, hidden beneath the surface of many of our villages lies a very different story, and the challenges that our villages face wasn't lost on the author of my guide almost 65 years ago. It is perhaps a slight exaggeration to call West Bay a port, for it is in no sense a place of refuge for shipping, since the little harbour formed by stone and wooden piers is only accessible in fair weather. If, as a harbour, it is dwindling in importance, as a pleasure resort, it is growing. You see, even decades ago when this was written, fishing was in trouble. For small coastal communities, fishing is a tough but vital business. In the 1930s, there were 47,000 fishermen in Britain. Now there's under 13,000. 
And then the average catch was 14 times what it is now. I'm meeting Dave Sales and Aubrey Banfield, who fished these waters for years. Hello, mate. How are you? Very well, thank nice you. Nice to see you. Nice yeah, to see yeah, you. Yeah. Colleague right. Aubrey. Hello, Aubrey. Yeah. Hello. How We're off to check on today's lobster and crab catch. How deep are the pots here? They're probably about 20, 25 feet. Not very deep. Oh, so it's not deep, no. is it? No. no. Crab is the staple for many of the boats in the area. Here it comes. And the bulk are sold to Spain and France. Lobsters are higher value, but caught in smaller numbers. And there's a big market for them in the UK. What is that? That's a nice lobster. Lots of crabs. That's a big one. He's a grandpa. Yeah. There's a little one. That's a little one, you see, with... Can you measure? Just on the back of the... Oh, it's soft. Right. To the back of there, and that so goes back. he's going back in. Oh, he's so beautiful. He's going back in now. Goodbye. <laughs> Dave's been fishing these waters for 33 years, and he's seen big changes. With EU quotas dictating the amount of fish that can be caught, and the huge start-up costs, Dave worries about future generations following him. If you want a youngster to come into it today, it's very expensive to do so. What is what you are buy the boat? Yes. Then you have to have the license, and the license very much is as much as what the boat is. Really? Ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes, thousands of pounds. So for a youngster, it's just not there. Right. And apart from the fact that a lot of the youngsters don't want to get up in the morning anyway. <laughs> West Bay is popular with tourists. But I wonder that if the fishing boats disappear, will its heart and soul? Villages can only thrive if they are allowed to evolve. I'm heading to a village that is constrained by its picture-perfect heritage and finding it hard to change. Milton Abyss is just as beautiful today as it was when my guidebook was written in the 1950s. Blocks of semi-detached cottages of identical design are spaced along either side of the wide road, and a chestnut tree planted between each block. The result is a village whose equal in serenity and quiet charm it would be hard to find. Nature and artifice are in complete harmony. The street bends with the turn of the valley, the banked-up woods are to be seen at hand, and the spreading chestnut trees bring nature into the street. Lovely. When you look around the village, it looks carefully planned, and it was. In 1776, Lord Milton, who lived here in Milton Abbey, thought an existing development was spoiling his rural vision, so he demolished it. He hired architect Sir William Chambers and landscape designer Capability Brown to make him a new village, out of sight. And this is the splendid result. However, to succeed, Villages need life, families, and young people. But these houses belong to a different age. Each building is divided into two small cottages, and conservation rules prevent any major alterations, so people simply outgrow them. Alan Tice is a local resident. Is there anyone in the village who was born and bred here? Yes, there are a couple uh, living over the road who uh, were born and bred in the village. Very, very few now. What's the average length of stay for residents, would you say? Is there an average? It's between eight or nine years. There have been some who've moved on after two or three years. Really? Again, probably from family, you know, they've had a house, they've had a couple of children, the house isn't big enough and they've, they've moved on. I can see the dilemma. These houses are beautiful but tiny and not really suited to modern family life. Oh, that's a pretty sitting room. 
with a beautiful fire. That's grand. Which, of course, these were workmen's cottages, so that would be the main form of heating, with a bread oven in there. It's lovely. But for the workman, this was their home for life, for as long as he kept working, because it would have been a tied cottage. Oh, life's a lot better now. Or is it? Traditionally, villages have prospered because the people who live in them also work near them. But rocketing property prices and the profusion of second homes is increasingly putting pay to that. Steve Gould and Tess Evans work the land in Milton Abbas, but they don't live here. Hello, Penelope. Nice yeah, to see nice, you. Nice to see you. Hello, Penelope. Tess, nice to see you. And who's this? Oh, that's Ginge. Hello, Ginge. He's just about to have his breakfast. Oh, give him some breakfast. Shall I give him some breakfast? You give him some breakfast. All right, Come I'll on, just Ginge. chuck a few back there and let him they not only keep pigs, Steve and Tess also grow vegetables on their 15 acres. Now, how long have you been farming here, then? About eight years now. Do you have a farmhouse here? No, we don't have a farmhouse here. Um, we actually live in Weymouth. That's rather a long way. Yes, it's... Um, that's all we can afford at the moment, really. We couldn't afford to live in the village. In the perfect world, you should as farmers live in the village. This area is attracting an increasing number of second homeowners and commuters, but they're not always comfortable with country life. There's obviously people in here perhaps that don't understand farming, you know, with cockerels crowing, for instance, or yes. pigs making a noise, or yes. smelly pigs. Or... And don't they realize that when they crow, they should get up? It's like you don't need an <laughs> alarm call. <laughs> You don't usually associate farming with commuting, but I suppose that's what Steve and Tess are, commuting farmers. Many people love the idea of living in a village and want to up sticks and move there. But this often means that it's only those who can afford to live there who can. And the danger is that the original community, the villagers, if you like, are pushed out and villagers become dormitories for city commuters or full of holiday homes. The threat to the centuries-old village way of life doesn't just come from economics. It also comes from Mother Nature. I'm heading to the Somerset Levels, a unique flat landscape of rivers and wetlands. It's one of the lowest parts of the country. And it's this geography, combined with nature, that had huge consequences for the villagers here last winter. Where I'm sitting now was an island. All around, there was water. We're on the first supply boat to this ancient village that's been encircled by flood water for a week. It's really quite dangerous coming into Mucholney because there are actually sunken cars underneath what used to be this country lane. Mucholney has a history of being deluged by floods. And last winter, it was cut off by flood water for 10 weeks. Hello? Hello? Oh, Penelope. Oh. Liz. Nice to see you. Liz Nightingale was one of the many villagers whose home was engulfed. The water may have gone for now, but her house still bears the scars. The water was about 15, 14 inches deep in here, which I suppose about, is about there. Right. And um, so all along here... All along here, it came, it came in... It didn't come in through the door initially. It came up through the, the floor. <gasps> And um, so I think it was probably about there, here. So being trapped here went on for 10 whole weeks. The village was cut off for 10 weeks. We had water in the house for eight weeks, water outside, immediately outside for nine weeks. I don't think we saw it on the news for quite a long time. So did you feel forgotten as a community? We did feel a bit forgotten about yes and uh, for quite some time in fact it was only when, when prince charles came that things got going 
Once the media picked up on the story, there were some high-profile visitors to the devastated village. But it was the local community all pulling together that helped the villagers cope. The church is our only community building, and we managed to have a service. The vicar came by boat, and most Sundays we actually managed to have um, a lunch in the church. We're all offered counselling for breaking our toes or... Yes. Losing our pets now. We, we were offered counselling. You were? We were, but we turned it down because we actually had each other. I mean, Peter and I decided we'd only talk about flooding on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't do that. There's always something going on, and we have to, um, you know, we end up talking about flooding most of the time. The village was mentioned in the Doomsday Book and the area has been tamed by man for thousands of years. However, recently the regular draining of ditches and waterways has tailed off, and it's this lack of land management that many of the locals claim has contributed to the flooding. But now there is a 20 million pound flood fund, and efforts to clear the watercourses have started. But Liz is taking matters into her own hands, She's constructing an embankment called a bund around her house in a bid to save her home if the floods return. We've dug it down to clay level. Right. And we're gradually building it up. It's quite high. It's, it's about, high. what, four foot, isn't it, yes. really? But it is a, that is actually a foot higher than the water was. And that was the worst the water has ever been, was yes. it, this year? Yes. And do you think the dredging of the rivers is going to help? It'll certainly help. I don't think it's the total answer. I think somehow they've got to stop the urban runoff, and they're still building loads and loads of houses up, up river. On floodplains? Yes. So I don't know what's going to happen, to be quite honest. Adversity certainly brings out the best in our village communities like Matchelney. I'm keeping my fingers firmly crossed that winter won't see a return of the floods. And if they do, I do hope Lizzie's bund does its job. Next, I visit the village keeping up its heritage with the help of the local youth. Well, wrapping chocolate you've made. Up. You should try some, it's really good. <laughs> and I meet a real lady of the manor. Who is going to run? Everybody except for me. <laughs> and, and me. <laughs> At one of the country's oldest fairs. Go! I'm on a journey through the villages of southwest England and heading to Wiltshire. The tradition of young people staying and working in their village and contributing to the local economy is under threat. But I'm in a village that might just have an answer. We hear a lot about villages losing post offices, shops, pubs, and the heart going out of them. But I'm in Albourne, and they seem to be bucking the trend. They've got a florist, a hairdresser's, a supermarket, post office. But there's one business in particular that's under really new management. This is Albourne Village Youth Council headquarters. Hello. 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 Gosh. What are you all doing? Wrapping chocolate we've made the night before, so... You actually make it? Yeah, it's part of our enterprise, really? Andy. Yeah. Gosh, so what is the council? It was set up when a group of children in the village decided they had nothing to do. They wanted to make a change. Handmade chocolate is the latest in a line of money-spinning schemes run by the youth council. They also look after a holiday cottage, an internet cafe, and a charity shop, with all proceeds being fed back into the Youth Council. Mmm! Oh, that's really good. <laughs> that is lovely. 
You should try some. It's really, really good. <laughs> mm. All this enterprise and industry in Auburn appears to be catching. There's a very traditional village business that's forged a remarkable return. When I was talking to the young people, they said Auburn has a smithy. I have to see it to believe it. Well, hey! Mark Hart reopened the smithy two and a half years ago, but it's been in his family for generations. It's so rare to find a village smithy. Yeah, it is. It's, it's very, very rare and becoming rarer. Isn't but, it sad? Yeah, this, this one here was shut for 30 years and um, it had been in my family since 1917. Mark's carrying on a tradition started by his great-grandfather, Noah Lydiard. Noah was an apprentice here in 1900. He went on to buy the business and reputedly shod the last working oxen in the village. Noah passed the business on to his son, Mark's great-uncle, who worked the forge up until the 1980s. So you mainly make what? Decorative? Um, yeah, it's mostly decorative items. And do the orders keep coming in? Yeah, they do. Since I started, the village have been really, really good. Really? Really supportive. The locals love having a working forge, and Mark's order book is pretty full. And what with the impressive creativity and hard work of the young people in the village, I think that the future of Auburn looks very rosy indeed. One of the big dates in a village calendar is the fete. Tradition often had it that they were held in the grounds of the local manor house. And I'm not one to turn down an invitation to a manor house. I'm in Yarlington, in Somerset, where there's been a summer fair for 700 years. Due to the great numbers attracted to fairs, they were often the scenes of great disturbances and riots, so you had to have a royal charter to hold one. Simon de Montcute got one for Yarlington in 1314. Thankfully, it's a lot more peaceful nowadays. Current owner of Yarlington House is Carolyn, Countess de Salis, and she is very much a modern lady of the manor. And I suppose when I got married and moved here, I suppose you were very much the sort of life that you might open fates. Yes, well, I was lady of the manor. Fairly hopeless at opening fates. I wasn't much good at it anyway. So I didn't open very many fates. <laughs> <laughs> but the lovely thing now about what's happened to villages, especially with our lovely village, is that there's no head boy anymore. We're all equal. Traditionally, village fairs were places for great enjoyment, but also trade. And Yarlington Fair was the location for an infamous piece of trade. There's a very interesting story that ha happened in 1789. Is Mr. Atwheel selling his wife to Mr. A Mr. Wadham, and she was led away with a halter around her neck. How much? For five shillings. Appalling. Five dollars, Appalling. But did that happen all over, do we think? Well, I think it did, but I think, yeah, I d it was quite, it wasn't, co it wasn't common, but it did definitely happen. It did. This real-life incident was supposedly the basis of the plot for Thomas Hardy's The Mayor of Casterbridge. In fact, wife selling in England did occur regularly. Between 1780 and 1850, over 300 cases were reported. It was a way of ending an unsatisfactory marriage when divorce was possible only for the very rich. I don't know, Penny. Perhaps we could all... Perhaps our husbands might be getting rid of us. We don't want to get that story out too much. No, no. Where are they? No, no, no. Yarlington Miles! My final task of the day is to act as starter for the Yarlington Mile. The words are... Ready... 
steady. Go! On my travels, I found villages and communities and landscapes that still endure since the days of Batsford. I've seen villages that have died, villages that have survived, and others that have positively thrived. Villages have been at the heart of our landscape for over 1,500 years. They've battled everything from the Black Death and the Civil War to the Industrial Revolution and the Technological Age. If they can survive all that and still look as good as they do, then I'm confident they can handle whatever the future holds. Sand dunes that sing and a lake that's broken out in spots. The world's weirdest weather. New and exclusive tomorrow at nine. And on Thursday at nine, Charlie Luxton brings us bracing beautiful properties in the new series Homes by the Sea. I come out next tonight on more for Timothy West and Prunella Scales take their great canal journey to North Wales. Mm -hmm.